today I'm going to be talking about um, the poems by Sir Thomas White. We're going to start with Who Sells to Hunt um, here in our um, series on sonnets. Um, so this is a Petrarchan um, form. So that means you have 14 lines divided into an eight line octave, followed by a six line sestet, um, which is the is the form that was made famous by Petrarch. But um, with Sir Thomas White is an English poet. He kind of took this form and kind of made it his his kind of signature, um, and he influenced um, a lot of the later. Uh, uh, later sonnet writers, William Shakespeare, Ben Jonson, uh, Sir Philip Sidney, Edmund Spencer. Um, so he had a lot of influence over that. So what you have here is the rhyme scheme of a Petrarchan sonnet is is pretty standard. Um, it's A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. We have a repetition of that for that second four lines of that octave, A, B, B, A. Um, and then you have that six line sestet that runs C, D, E, C, D, E. Um, he wrote the sonnet around a fifth, between 1530 and 1540. Um, and so, um, clearly, um, it was, um, uh, once we read it and we kind of discuss it, we're talking about a dejected lover, uh, kind of under the ruse of talking about a hunt, um, popular uh, pastime uh, where the hunting and the hounds and, and hunting for deer or fox or uh, wild hogs or, you know, whatever they, they hunted boars, they hunted back then. Um, and so you have a lover here who, uh, who's been dejected um, and, or rejected, I guess I should say, that has been chasing after a woman uh, for quite some time. And he writes about this as, uh, in, as, a, as a metaphor, the hunt as a metaphor for this chase. Um, so there is a lot of, um, uh, this is one of two poems that's supposedly about Anne Boleyn. Just a little background for you about Anne Boleyn. Um, so Anne Boleyn uh, was a courtier in uh, Henry VIII's court. Um, she would go on to, so Henry was married to someone else who could not provide him with a male heir. Uh, Anne Boleyn basically kind of rustled in and said, you know, oh, I can provide you a male heir. Um, and so the history goes that, you know, um, that Henry VIII formed his own church so that he could get a divorce. So the Catholic Church said, nope, you can't get a divorce from your wife. Um, and so he decided, well, you know what, I'm going to form my own church and then I can get as many divorces as I want. Um, and so he formed the Church of England. And so Anne Boleyn, quite an iconic uh, figure, but before she was in league with the king, um, it was uh, widely... Um, acknowledge that she was one of uh, Sir Thomas White's lovers. And um, King Henry didn't like that too much. He actually sent White away uh, in 1527, sent him away from court on a diplomatic mission to Italy, um, basically just trying to get rid of his potential rival, get him away from court. Um, and so Henry goes on and, and marries Anne Boleyn and uh, a lot of things happen. She's unable to provide him a male heir. Um, and uh, she ends up losing her life for treason, which brings Thomas White back up. So he's in prison in 1536 uh, for the crime of having carnal knowledge of the queen. Uh, and Henry VIII um, executes uh, Anne Boleyn uh, while it was freed from prison. And so this is one of two poems. The other one is the old mule um, that is supposedly about Anne Boleyn. So let's read it and let's get into our analysis of it really quick. Um, so we have, Whoso lives to hunt, I know where is in hind, but as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore. I am 
of them that farthest come behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting, I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Whoso lists her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain, engraven with diamonds, in letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about, noli me tanger, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. So in the first two lines, the speaker is offering anyone listening a little tip and also a warning. He says, I know where is in hind. I know the location of a female deer. So our speaker is a hunter and he is, um, for some unknown reason, he's willing to give up the location of a potential kill to our listener if they list a hunt or want to go hunting. Obviously, he's not talking about a deer here. He's talking about a lady, and so far, she's evaded being caught by anyone, including by himself. And so he presents her with no, uh, this lady with no emotions or feelings. I know where there's a deer that you can hunt if you so choose. He says, but as for me, I may know more. I may not hunt her anymore. So I'm going to, I'm going to give it up. I got to give up the hunt. Um, and so he's kind of giving a tip. Like I know where you can find this deer, but also, you know, don't go in the same direction that I went because it has affected me so. And so in lines three and four, we kind of get into that. So it gives the reader a bit more detail. The vein travail. Uh, hath wearied me so sore, I'm of them that farthest come behind. So he sees the hunt of this particular hind to be a vain travail, a fruitless hunt. It's not going to get you anywhere. And it has wearied him so sore. His mind, he's exhausted. It's hopeless. It's a hopeless situation. He's done his best, but he always is in the group that comes behind the, the, of them. Uh, the hunting group that farthest come behind. No matter how hard he tries, he's always going to be last. There's no point in even attempting to hunt her. Um, in lines five through eight, He's offering her up to someone else. He says, yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth the fourth fainting, I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Whoso list her to hunt, I put uh, him out of doubt. Um, his wearied mind is, is, has been trapped in this endless cycle of um, running in circles around her, trying to catch her. Um, he cannot draw from the deer. He can't, he says, I can't leave the chase. Like I can't, he's still, you know, in love with her, charmed by her, uh, you know, um, she has this powerful hold, but he is, you know, still always going to be behind her, no matter how hard he tries or how far he runs. The faster he's chasing her, the further the distance is growing in between them. And it's, it's a it's a fruitless we said it's a fruitless hunt but it's also an exhausting hunt he says uh fainting i follow her influence is so strong that it's 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 literally taking it's sucking all the life out of him so it's also clear here that it's become kind of an obsession um and and he's telling us that he wants to give it up he says i may know more um you know, I can't draw from the deer. Um, he's trying to free himself, but it's an impossible task. It's an impossible task to catch her, and it's also an impossible task for him to give up the fight because it's it's he's never going to be able to achieve it. He says it's like seeking to hold the wind uh, in a net, which is impossible to do. So, in lines 9 and 10, who's a listener to hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. Um, this is the opening of that sestet, and he's talking to whoever will be the next person that will try to hunt her. And he's saying, you know, I'm going to put you out of doubt. You're never going to catch her. It's an impossible task. 
you're going to spend your time in vain, just like I have. Um, and his tone is a little different here. It's a little bit more direct. It's passionless. It's cold. Um, it's something that he's come to the realization of, but he's, he's still unwilling to kind of let it go. Um, but they're wasting their time. Anybody that's trying to go after, they're wasting, um, you're wasting your time. Uh, look and see, like use me as an example, like this is what, um, this is what we're looking at. In lines 11 through 14, we have, he goes into a little bit of detail here in these last lines of the poem, 11 through 14. He's talking about the deer um, as, as being marked. He says, engraven with diamonds in letters plain, there is written her fair neck about, round about, nulli me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. Um, so these words are um are there and not only are they written they're written with diamonds they're graven with diamonds around her neck um and the noli me tanger means do not touch me in latin do not touch me uh she says for caesar's or he says for caesar's i am uh, which is an illusion obviously um, we're not really talking about Caesar. If we're following along with the whole Anne Boleyn idea, then we would be talking about Henry VIII. Um, but this Noli Me Tangere, this is a reference to the Bible in which Jesus, after he rises from the dead, says in John 20, 17, touch me not. Um, uh, and because she's already claimed here, she's already claimed here by someone else. And he's a powerful man, right? Because she, he's, she's marked with diamonds around her neck. Uh, you're not going to catch this deer because it belongs to Caesar. It belongs to the king. And she is wild for to hold, which means she's hard to hold on to or could it possibly even be dangerous, even though she seems tame. Um, and so it's he wants his reader to learn from his... Um, his ways, his, his, this fruitless search that he's been on all this time uh, to try to catch this uncatchable deer. Um, and it's an exhausting uh, journey. It's a, a fruitless search, a fruitless hunt. It's never going to come to fruition because she already belongs to someone else.